the mission of AC-7 was about threefold, but we were the first designated for combat search and rescue in the Navy. We flew uh, in up pretty far north, not too far south of uh, Hanoi, and did a uh, horseshoe uh, pattern uh, over the beach and then back out again, and we hadn't found anything on our first trip. And uh, the A-6 went back in again for the second uh, time around and found some movers, and we followed in to uh, see if we could work that particular target. On the first circuit, uh, the SAM site locked us up on our radar. The radar operator had locked us up very quickly, just a couple of seconds, which was much faster than most of the operators that we had seen previously. I said to John, I sure hope this guy doesn't shoot because he's really hot stuff. And he didn't. And because we hadn't found targets on our first pass around looking for moving trucks at night uh, with two other aircraft, uh, we decided to make, at the, at the leader's command, we tried to make one more pass around, maybe think that they wouldn't suspect that we were going to make a second pass around. And uh, uh, unfortunately, they were there waiting for us, and, uh, and uh, they illuminated us and fired the missiles. Got away from the first two, uh, and then we found that we were uh, out of airspeed, out of altitude, and uh, out of ideas, and the third one hit us. And at the last minute, we uh, tried to dive away from it. It hit someplace underneath the belly of the airplane, and we think uh, blew off the right wing. It was just blinding yellow-white. The impact of that was so strong, I literally opened my mouth to see if my teeth were, were going to spit out. I mean, it's, it hit that hard. I boxed in college, and so it's been hit hard a couple of times, but this was hard, fast hard. And uh, uh, realized that everything in the airplane was dead, that uh, there was no radio, there was no intercom, the stick was clear over to one side. Um, and I yelled at the top of my voice. Of course, we have on an oxygen mask, we have on a helmet. Uh, I yelled through the oxygen mask, get out, get out and reach for the ejection curtain. We ejected and the seat fired and parachutes opened and we went from there. Went into the lovely night sky over North Vietnam and uh, at that point you sort of said, well, I'm alive, but I think I've got some problems ahead. I landed in a, in a very freshly dunged rice paddy right up to about here when I, because I fell backwards into this stuff and I realized right away that I was in a uh, deep uh, rice paddy. <laughs> Yeah, I heard John splash, so I got out of my chute and uh, uh, dropped my seat pan and uh, went over and met him, and we took off. We were we were not on uh, call at that time. We were sitting on a ship off the coast of uh, North Vietnam, just about uh, down south near the DMZ. We were uh, awoken about uh, midnight. I'm not going to give exact times here, but about midnight. Uh, Saw alarm goes off in the ship, so everybody gets out of bed. And I went back to the aircraft and got the engine started and everything ready for takeoff except the uh, rotor blade. And so Lieutenant uh, Clyde Lassen came back, strapped in the aircraft, and, and we launched. And then we took a position where the ship told us to and uh, waited for further instructions. Took off on a very black night. There was no moon. There was it was kind of airy getting off. And and the H2 that we were flying had one engine and. It was notoriously uh, underpowered as far as its you know, capability to fly. It turned out there had been an F-4 shot down. Uh, the normal procedure would have been to wait until the next day, daylight, in order to uh, pick this pilot up. So we were talking in the aircraft, and that was pretty well the consensus that they were going to we were going to fly around here for a little while. It was very dark, and uh, that they'd land us back and we'd end up going in in the morning to pick up these bodies. So we thought this was going to be uh, mostly a drill and we'd be called back. And so we positioned off the coast of North Vietnam and flew a racetrack pattern waiting for the call to come back to the ship. And instead they said, okay, your signal is go and go on in. And, and, and we were told to go in after the F-4 pilot and his Rio who had been shot down which was uh, pretty much shocked all of us, I believe. One of the things that made it unique was that no uh, night over land had ever been attempted before. So we went in and started a rescue. I think we went in about 5,000 foot high, and we're flying at 130 knots probably. We went in at about 5,000 feet to, to keep out of small arms fire, but put us right up there where the, uh, the anti-aircraft fire was. We did have two SAMs come at us and they both missed. As we were flying along we could see the burning uh, aircraft wreckage off in the future so we know the general direction to fly. 
and then we had a uh, had a missile shot at us, and I heard it go by the aircraft and with a big whoosh. Saw the trail of sparks as it went by, you know, and said, well, they missed us, so we continued on. And it was a determination by everyone that it missed because we were going so slow. <laughs> uh, because these same Sams just shot down that Phantom. It was okay until we got in over the uh, over the, where the survivors were. We had difficulty finding them. They had a survival radio on the ground that they were talking to us, and we had instrumentation in the aircraft that pointed to it, but it was only generally where they were. We had uh, radio comm with the pilots through their PRC-90, and we also uh, detected their uh, strobe light, and we, we got a fix on them. Uh, Dallas positioned the, uh, the helicopter uh, over them, uh, which were, they were on a, a hilltop. The trees in that area were about 200 feet tall, and that was about the maximum. We had a 200-foot cable. That was the, the height, and so we tried to hover over them, and, and uh, we couldn't. We had our full length of, of, of hoist cable out. I was on that side of the helicopter. It's 200 foot deep, 200 foot long, and they couldn't reach us. We missed the first couple of uh, uh, line pickups. The last one, I, the line went a few inches over my fingertips through the trees, and I reached up like this. I could just not quite touch it. It was six inches above my hand, and I thought, well, you know, that's it. So we started lowering down into the trees in order to be there. And because it was a dark moonlight, moonless night, uh, the aircraft overhead, <clears throat> excuse me, the jets were sending out illumination flares that hung from parachutes and gave us, uh, you know, just a, like a false moon. And so we, we tried to hover and there was just not enough power to do it in the hot temperature. We, uh, Dallas lowered the, uh, the, the penetrator to try to extract the, uh, the pilots because uh, we did have radio comm with them. And uh, the flares went out. As soon as the flares went out, uh, of course, we were in absolute darkness. We lost all reference with the uh, trees around us, and so we drifted into one, hit a tree, pitched nose down to the left, and not sure how we got out of there and under that black night, because, but we did. And, but after that, the aircraft was damaged. Of course, Lassen had uh, automatically said, no, that's, that's very unsafe. Let's go ahead and uh, try to... Uh, get back off, get off the hill, get into a clearing which we spotted uh, a little farther down the, the hill. We could see the people on the ground shooting at us. We could see the muzzle flashes. And uh, <clears throat> so we told them that they would have to get to the uh, clearing because there was no way that we were going to get them from the jungle. It was just too tricky and, and uh, too risky and we didn't want to join them. We landed, uh, when we did, we had to, we had to land with our, our uh, uh, the hover lights on. Uh, because the flares went out again, we, uh, we called, or us cab told me and said uh, that basically that they, uh, we needed more flares uh, to illuminate the area because uh, turning the lights on was uh, almost a dead giveaway. Uh, as we did this, of course, uh, Dallas and myself were uh, basically suppressing the enemy fire at the time. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I know for a fact uh, we both silenced positions on each side of us. They said, okay, we're ready, you know, come in and get us, and we made an approach. We landed in the rice paddy again, and now this time we could start seeing the figures getting closer, you know, running and shooting at us, but they were stumbling across the rice paddy uh, dikes and stuff, and, and that impeded their advancement on us. And we sat there for a while, and we sat there, and we sat there, and uh, they said, no, we can't make it yet. So we took off, and we flew around again until we were called back. We did this two more times. Both times we waited for a few minutes and no, we can't get there yet, so we took off. The second time when we lifted off, that's when uh, Sam's came up and uh, both Dallas and I kind of were almost in unison and said, holy, you know. We were starting to get pretty heavy fire, pretty intense fire uh, from the ground, from the small arms fire, because now the people who had been running from different areas were coagulating, you know, they were getting into different groups and we, we had them coming from our nose, we had them coming from the right side, we had them coming from the, from behind us as we were making these approaches and we could now start picking up details of who, of, that they were people and not just figures. And in fact on this fourth time when we were uh, finally down on the ground we could see their faces. I called uh, Clyde and uh, Leroy Cook and said, uh, hey gents if you don't pick us up in the next 10 seconds or so you ain't gonna pick us up because we're, they're right here. About Coming through a couple of hundred feet of approach, again, the parachute flares, the illumination flares burned out. And that's when Clyde turned on all of his landing lights to aid in the landing. And I walked out at that point with a strobe light and held it up in a 
what I thought was a good place to land. And I was talking to him on the radio, and they had this strobe light in the other hand. And then he, he said, OK, we're coming in. And they turned down their landing light at that point and flew right in and landed. And there we sat with landing lights, big circle of light around us, and landing light from the nose, and people firing at us from all directions. And Don West and I are, are on the left side of the aircraft watching the jungle. And all of a sudden, these two dark figures burst out of the jungle and started running at us. And I told him, I said, if they start shooting, <laughs> you don't hesitate. But fortunately, it was, uh, it was not the North Vietnamese, but the two people we were looking for, John Holtzblatt and John Burns. And curiously enough, they, we, this was about, uh, I'd guess, about 300 yards that they were around. And they got about less than halfway towards us. And we started taking fire right from where they, that the, the North Vietnamese were about seconds behind them. Because if we hadn't uh, been successful that time, they would have been captured. There's no doubt about that. When they landed, uh, Bruce Dallas, the starboard gunner, was out of the airplane in a heartbeat, was around in front of it, and was heading right straight towards me. And when he saw that I was running a pretty good clip, he jumped back in and began to man his machine gun again. And he thought I was coming from the port side of the helicopter. He thought I was going to jump in a port door. When I came around the starboard side, he was hit an aft swing on his machine gun, and he swung it around like this. And I put my arm up, and, and the gun slapped me in the arm, and he grabbed me by the seat of the pants and threw me across the helicopter. And he reached out and one-handed, grabbed him, threw them, but one at a time into the back of the aircraft, and took off and slapped light on the shoulder, which was the signal to get the heck out of there. And went back to his machine gun, which was an M60, and was uh, and helped give us cover fire as we flew out. When we were doing this, the thing about Clyde Lassen is uh, the co-pilot, Leroy Cook, was shooting an M16 out one window with, with the shells hitting the windshield coming back into Clyde's face. I, at the same time, had the muzzle of an M60 just like eight inches from his head. In fact, there's a little flap of armor plating on one side. I actually hit it twice. There's two, there's two scrapes on it because I was shooting straight forward when we came in. And he still maintained his cool and, and kept us alive. That's what it amounted to. <laughs> so he rescued not only two downed pilots, but our crew also. About the time we got over the, uh, the beach and headed into, in, over the water, we started picking up a lot of anti-aircraft fire at that time, too. And in the, in the progress, as we were flying out, Bruce Ellis went to close the door, which was standard practice, because we knew that you couldn't get above 100 knots, or you shouldn't be above 100 knots and with the door open. And as he slid the door forward, it had been damaged, and it flew off the track, flew out of his hand, and fluttered down to be a souvenir for some North Vietnamese farmer. <laughs> but as we got over, we had our 20-minute fuel light illuminate, which meant we had somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes of fuel left, and the, the ship was still about 15 minutes away. And so. Fortunately, we didn't have to put it in the water, and as we came in, made the, the ship turned on all its lights. The ship uh, commanding officer violated his standing orders to stay out of range of the shore gunneries, and he came within, uh, I forget, I did 12 or miles or less, and uh, turned on all his lights for us. So, I mean, he did an equally courageous and, and uh, brave act, which made it much easier for us to make that one end landing, because there wasn't enough fuel to make a second approach. We landed with about five minutes of fuel or eight minutes of fuel, something like that. And the gauges were very unreliable when you got down to that level. And I'll tell you today, that's when we landed, the engine flamed out. Now, whether or not last in time they're off, I don't know, but I'm a, I'm a mech, I'm an AD. So, and I know what a difference between deceleration and just complete flame out. So, and we checked the fuel system out and there was less than five, fuel, five minutes of fuel left. So, we're talking about fuel control, how much it's got in it. We're talking about, and, and it, to me, it flamed out. But then again, we're talking about over 30 some odd years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> Clyde said to me, I, I, we got out to the ship, and I said, man, you know, look at that fuel gauge. And he, he said, yeah, well, we were thinking about uh, landing and staying with you guys, give you a little more firepower until somebody else showed up. <laughs> wow. But that's just the way they were. That's just the way they are. They still are that way. All these guys are that way, that you see. The Lassen's uh, motto printed on the ship and printed on their programs and all is, is uh, from courage, life. It's those three words. 
And that really means from courage, from the courage of an air crew who risked everything to go in and save us, came the remainder of our life since 1968. The real heroes here are Clyde Lassen, Leroy Cook, Bruce Dallas, and Don West. Those guys really hung it out to get us. I mean, really long way out. And that's why this is a Congressional Medal of Honor Award, because it's a little teeny helo. It's the middle of the night. It's a long way inland. We're already, if you're on the ground more than an hour in those days, your chances of getting caught were immensely high. We're on the ground for two hours and 12 minutes. We had all these people after us. It was just a miracle. My daughter was then four years old, and I had to do some convincing to get her to come down from New York to here today, and uh, made a point of saying, you know what those words mean? And she said, well, of course, from courage life. That, that must mean if you had some courage, your life is better. And I, no, that's not what it really means. It means that because of the courage of this air crew and the person who this ship is named after, who risked everything to come in and get us, you're here, I'm here, and your life is what it is today, and it wouldn't have been that had not this event occurred. I mean, I, I can't say enough about those four men. They are absolutely perfect.